one of us in Ernst Young, Audrey Obidike, our national director with the Global Compliance Reporting Tax Services uh, Department. And the second session will be taken by no other person than uh, uh, Dr. Iri, the coordinating director, compliance supply uh, support group with Federal Inland Revenue Service headquarters in Abuja. So that will be the first part. The second session is the panel section where we're going to have, I mean, real uh, drilling down into the issue. And uh, we have a lot of people that we've drafted to do justice to this. And after that, we'll move into the question and answer section and uh, a, a bit of uh, housekeeping. So as soon as the presentation is going on and we're, we're entering into the panel session, we expect that you start throwing your questions or clarification into the chat box. Somebody is here who is going to be in charge of that to take that for us. And thereafter, after the Q&A, we're going to move to the closing session, which uh, uh, we expect our um, uh, tax leader for West Africa to, to take that. So without much ado, because I know we are going to have a lot of things to talk about at the panel section and at the same time attending to questions. Um, I will want to call on the first paper presenter with uh, Audrey Obdike. Audrey will be talking to us on salient consideration on the amendment of Section 23 of Finance Act, which is bringing us to this webinar this morning that talks about taxation of educational institutions in Nigeria. My name is James Adeago. I'm a partner with the tax service line of Ernst & Young. I will be the anchor of this webinar today. So Audrey OBDK, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, James. Um, you're all welcome to this webinar, um, basically focusing on um, the taxation of educational institution as a result of the amendment made to the Finance Act 2021. In order for us to discuss this and have an understanding, I, I would like us to go through what the law was prior to um, 2021, and then we will be talking about the post um, 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 amendment in terms of the Finance Act that has just been signed into, into law, and then we will talk about um, some of the tax um, implication as well as our compliance. Now, proud to the Finance Act Amendment of 2021, um, based on Section 23, Subsection 1 um, C, basically ecclesiastical, charitable, and educational institution in terms of the activity were exempted from tax on the basis that they weren't deriving profit from, you know, trade or business. Um, over time, that has been challenged by the Federal Inland Revenue. And this, um, we can see two cases um, where this was actually challenged and taken to the TAT, which is the American International School of Lagos, as well as the Best Children International School um, Limited. In this case, basically um, what has happened is that um, the, the case was basically to judge the form in which these companies or this educational institution were actually set up. And in, from their incorporation, we can see that one was actually limited by guarantee and the other limited by shares. Now, what the courts did in this instance, based on the nature of um, institutions um, limited by guarantee and the fact that they are not set up for the purpose of making profit or distributing profit because in CAMA, in the Company and Allied Matters Act and sec, um, subsection um, section 23, uh, 26, yeah. it actually states that companies limited by guarantee are not expected to distribute profit. They're expected to plow back those profits in order to promote education, right? And so for any entity that is actually set up as limited by guarantee, not distributing profit, um, uh, then is expected to then plow that back into um, 
that particular activity it is actually promoting in order to expand that promotion. However, in sec um, with um, the best children international school, what we can see there is that the setup was more of a limited by um, by shares. And in that instance, investors in such um, um, enterprise will be expected to get a return. And so for that instance, it's stated that the intention of the company is actually to make profit and therefore not uh, um, not expected to be exempted for tax purposes, even though the nature of the activity was also to promote um, education. Um, so in, in the in the instance of F, um, FY um, 2021 Finance Act Amendment, we can see that that was now expunged in terms of education um, activity of companies of um, institution engaged in educational activity expunge from you know section 23 subsection 1 and so what is the implication of this what does it mean that they should be taxable in the instance that if they are even set up as limited by guarantee where they are not distributing profit should they now be exempt from uh, should they now be exempt from this exemption um, whereby they will be expected to then pay taxes. Now, this is what these are the issues that we're going to look into um, in this discussion. And in doing that, then what are the implication of this? The implication then means that the company will then be, you know, subject to income tax for which they need to pay taxes for, and the taxes could range between um, zero percent to about thirty percent, depending on the state of that institution, whether it is a small, a medium or a large enterprise, depending on the threshold of the entity. Now, recall that other provision of the law in terms of CETA, CGT um, and VAT exempt setting income of this institution from taxes and it still remains that way. And so companies that now fall into this threshold in terms of the exclusion of educational activity from section 23, subsection 1C, then means that they will be expected to file their return, you know, six months after year end. And then from extension of that, where they do not then meet those filing obligations, they are um, interest and penalty that will be applicable in the instance of a failure. Now, in, in terms of other extension, in terms of other taxes that they need to comply with will then be educational taxes, um, value added taxes. We already know that from the extension of, you know, the Finance Act 2019 and um, extension by 2020, that has actually exempted ed and books and educational material from um, being exempted from taxes, uh, that's VAT, and also the, um, um, the tuition fee paid by primary, secondary and tertiary institution from VAT. The other taxes also that may be now being applicable would then be withholding taxes. Now withholding tax as the educational institution deal with their vendors, right? You want to look, they would need to look at their contract in those regard to then um, confirm how um, withholding tax will be applicable on those transactions. But as it concerns the income of the educational institution, are we then saying that parents should deduct withholding tax? Well, because of the administrative nature of that, parents can't. However, where there are other institutions that probably engage with those other uh, with um, educational institutions, of course, they would have a right whereby um, these educational institutions are then taxable. In looking at this at a holistic view, one thing we need to understand is that for educational institution, they will be very familiar with the accounting circle as it concerns their business in terms of accounting and treasury. Now it is now very imperative for them to now educate their um, their resource in terms of understanding the tax function and the tax um, implication of most of their transaction, given the fact that they will be you know taxable to the extent um, that they may not be exempted from. Um, taxation. So it's important that their records are put in order. Um, it's important that documentation supporting those records from an accounting perspective are actually put, um, you know, documented because what, what is not documented is not given. So um, it, it, um, it, it is not available 
for the FRS now to then rely upon such transaction. It is also very important that the accounting system, the accounting function, even the review of contracts that these educational institutions now have, you know, with their vendors and probably with their customer, these are reviewed from a tax perspective in order to make sure that they're efficient. Recall that at the beginning, we had discussed that tax application may range between um, zero to about 30%, right? And without docu proper documentation, what then happens is that that can go above 30%. There's a likelihood where documentation not supporting these transactions are not in place. So it is important not just, you know, um, understanding what the law states, but how this then applies um, to the transaction of educational institutions. So I'm hoping that during this deliberation and when we're to ask questions regarding this area as taxes applied to educational institutions, that we ask questions as to how we then implement this in a tax efficient way in order to take minimize our tax cost in order to run a profitable business. So thank you at this point. I hope that um, questions will come in whereby we will then attend to more practical issues as it concerns um, the educational institution. Thank you very much. Over to you, James. Yeah, so so thank you, Audrey. And I think you, you really dwell on a lot of points that by the time we come to the time of uh, the panel section and also question and answer, we'll be able to really address that. So let, let me remind the teaming audience here, please, you can start to drop your questions in the chat box. Somebody is able to collect the question. So uh, at this point in time, let me hand over to um, uh, Dr. Dick Erie. Um, he, he will be able to give us um, uh, the FRS position and uh, what model is FRS holding to their chest. Because as we speak now, today we've not seen anything in the, in the news or in the air that shows how this is going to be implemented. So let's see if Dr. Iri will be able to drop some of those to our team audience here today. So Dr. Iri, over to you, sir. So doctor, please, you need to unmute. You need to unmute your mic, sir. Dr. Ari, you still need to check the, the 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 mic icon. Just uh, somebody should click on the mic icon, and we'll be able to hear you. Hello. Yeah, our audience, please, our apologies for this. Um, I know you really want to hear from uh, Dr. Dick Erie to know what is the perspective of FRS as their position. So just give us like a minute there about to sort this out. All of us want to hear him. I saw him leaving and think he, he needs to rejoin. But prior to him coming back. So um, Audrey has stated some facts here as regards the issue of the incorporation of um, the, the schools, educational institutions, how they were incorporated. So one of the questions that I've seen in the chat box is that, is this going to still be enforced? So I think those are part of the thing that Dr. Iri will need to, to attend to. 
let's just give him a bit of a time like uh, one or two minutes. So if uh, if you can get him, I think we can now move to the panel section so that we can try to recoup time here. Okay, it's coming in. Okay, better now. It's better now. Is it showing you? Okay, so Dr. Harry, just you, set your camera. And you can hear me now. We can hear you now. Loud and you can clear. hear me. Okay. okay, no problem. Calm down. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, thank you, sir. Go ahead. Thank, I'm very sorry for this uh, slight uh, hiccup and the uh, computer system. Uh, we've lost some time, so I'll quickly go straight to the issue at hand. This morning, I will take us through quickly uh, by six, uh, just the uh, outline, introduction, the position of uh, this uh, topic, uh, education, uh, transition of educational institution before the Finance Act 2021, post Finance Act, likely small obligation of uh, educational institution, and also bring a dimension of uh, third fund, since I'm speaking from the law administ the administrator perspective. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you on this uh, on this uh, webinar. As you know, FRS is uh, the uh, agency that has a mandate to administer, to assess, collect, and account, uh, and even enforce a tax payment for the federal government. As you are aware, we have three tiers of government. We represent the federal government. However, whatever FRS put together at the federal level is shared among the three tiers of government. And our vision, of course, to do, in doing this, we want to ensure that we deliver quality service to the taxpayer and also do it efficiently and transparently through a robust system, tax system. Now, before the, pre, the Finance Act of 2021 that was signed into law in December, the law, as it, as it were, actually exempted all the income or prof, most, uh, let me call it profit of most educational institutions. What the law actually says in that section 23, uh, subsection 1 and subsection C, is that the profit of any company engaged in ecclesiastical, charitable, or educational activities of a public character. Now, in where the law was coined, charitable and educational activity was put as alternative, or not and, or they were not, they are seen that uh, they either educational or charitable. They were all exempted from. Uh, profit from a tax, from income tax. However, what was it uh, that was being taxed then? The profit of uh, any company that uh, was involved in educational institution was uh, uh, exempted. If it has capital gain relating to that activity was also exempted as long as does not, it's not related to disposal of asset acquired in the course of trade or business. Value added tax to also introduce some exemption in terms of um, uh, books and educational materials. And of course, in 2019, when the Finance Act came on board, it introduced exemption of uh, uh, tuition fees for nursery, primary, and tertiary education. They were exempted from that. Payee, as we know, relates to the staff or the salary that the staff, the people that work in, um, I mean, personnel that work in such institutions and which goes to the state, respective states. Now, what is it that the Finance Act has introduced? And I must put it because this is a public uh, enlightenment uh, platform. We must know that uh, the issue of the Finance Act is driven by the Minister of, fin Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning. And this, uh, uh, this uh, ministry do this through the instrumentalities of the Physical Policy Reform Committee that uh, the Minister of Finance have set up they are a body of people pulled all over the federation, different professional background, belong to different professions and the rest. They pull all of them together. They are the ones that actually co collate all the inputs that uh, individuals and uh, public entities have made together for purpose of form, uh, coming up with a finance, a yearly finance ad that goes with the, the appropriation act. And National Assembly enacted them into law. It started in 2019. 
2020 edition, and the last one was the 2021. Now, the, what happened in 2021 was that while the law was being, the financial was being finalized, the National Assembly, in their own wisdom, because they are also in the public and they interface with the public anyway, in their own wisdom, felt that educational institution should be a sponge from uh, that uh, exemption clause. And the word educational activity was a sponge from that section 23, uh, subsection 1C. That is what now gave rise to the transition of uh, the profit of uh, companies that uh, either incorporated or whatever form, whatever legal nature they, they, they come or the vehicle they use in driving such uh, educational activity are now subject to tax. What is the obligation? We expect them to first register and get a, a, a tax pay identification number. We expect them to file their annual returns. We expect them to also file their monthly VAT return. And we expect them to also, if they have uh, withheld the uh, withholding tax from their vendors and uh, credit or distributors uh, uh, and suppliers, we expect them to also file their withholding tax uh, return. If they are the staff that work in those organizations, they earn salaries, they expect, we expect them to deduct uh, with, uh, personal income tax from their, I mean, payee from their taxes, their income, and remit to the appropriate uh, state uh, internal revenue. And of course, keep accurate record and uh, an account which uh, they need to verify, there's need to, ver to verify, it could easily be verified. I need to also bring this on board, the, ter the third fund dimension, because uh, this is a public uh, uh, awareness creation. There's uh, this uh, third fund that uh, it has been existing for some time now, and before the 2021 uh, Finance Act, the rate of tax there was 2% uh, of the accessible profit of a company that is registered in Nigeria, but the finance act 2021 increases to 2.5%. And what this uh, third fund uh, is also administered by the Federal Revenue Service, the fund that is put together yearly from this source is used for purpose of uh, providing um, infrastructure in our public uh, institution, either university, polytechnic, or college of education, set up by the, either the federal government or the state government. Also, the channel to us uh, providing resources for financing research, research and um, academic tra staff training, and any other uh, area that they deem fit that uh, this um, money can be channeled into. It's important for us to take note that this one exists and is for the public institution owned by the federal government or the state set up by the federal government or the state government. So this is uh, what the Finance Act 2021 has brought to bear that from now on, every uh, uh, entity that is incorporated, whatever the form of its incorporation, since the word education has been removed from exemption clause, is now subject to pay company income tax. The other exam, other taxes like uh, VAT, the exemption still exists, either in uh, mat educational material or services, and I'm sure the question will bring out more out from uh, as we engage our, our audience in the question and answer, more of these details will come out. But this is just a rundown of the quick, uh, just a quick rundown of uh, the what uh, the Finance Act 2021 has brought to bear for all of us to battle with. We encourage you to be to remain uh, faithful and also be good citizen as you pay your taxes to develop our educational institution and also provide work for these students, all these children when they graduate from their various institutions to have something to do, to put on the table for their family. Thank you very much and thank you for listening. Once again, sorry for the initial hiccup at the start. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah, so so, so thank you, um, Dr. Iri. Um, yeah. That was a very wonderful one um, from your side. And uh, I think some of the things you said must have elicited a lot of questions in the heart of our um, uh, participants on this web. Please, let's continue to drop um, our questions in the chat box. I saw some questions that has rolled in. So please, let's continue to get that on. So I think at this point in time, without much ado, we need to be moving to the panel section where we really want to drill down I mean, really into 
what we have um, for discussion this morning. So let me first of all introduce the people that we have um, as our panelists this morning. So um, we are still trying to get um, Professor Ishola Akintoye on. He has been on before, and I think the the network is not really supporting him at all. So I, my belief is that we are still going to have him in before we finish this uh, panel session. So uh, Professor Ishola Akintoye, I may not be able to introduce him again by the time he comes into the room. Professor Ishola Akintoye is a professor in the School of Management of Science, uh, Management of Management, School of Management Science at uh, Bangkok University. So he's an erudite professor who has been involved in a lot of things and is also a visiting uh, pro to uh, National Open University and some other um, uh, institutions. So he has seen it very well in that sector. So he will be sharing his view and uh, uh, what he has seen in that place. She's the of uh, advisory uh, output. This is an uh, advisory output that has helped um, uh, institutions and companies in the educational sector at the secondary level, secondary school level, to really help them coming up with a lot of strategies, helping them for recruitment, helping them to set up um, some uh, needed procedure that they have. So we saw YMC here as an erudite person as regards this educational sector, she will be bringing on some perspective for us in this. We've had a lot of conversation before this webinar today. Um, also, we have one of our own, our partner in Ernst & Young, Temitokwe Samagbei. Temitokwe Samagbei is the partner in charge of uh, business tax uh, services in Ernst yeah, & Young, and uh, is part of the people that covered all the okay, non-oil and, uh, oil and gas uh, oil and gas sector uh, business in next and young. Also in the panel today, uh, the two speakers that you've had this morning, they'll be joining the panel. I'm talking of uh, Dr. Dick Iri, who is the coordinating director at uh, FRS office in Abuja, and uh, our very own also, Audrey Obedike, our national director in the Global Compliance uh, and, and Reporting. So thank you, um, uh, uh, the panelists and thank you for making yourself available this morning. So from the from the discussion that has happened here today, the presentation of uh, Audrey and also the perspective of um, Federal and Revenue Service that we had from uh, Dr. Iri. So let, let me begin with you, Yemisi. Yemisi, if you look at it, you are somebody that has really tread the terrain of uh, the educational institution in Nigeria. Um, and also a, a strategic advisor to these people. So I, I, I want you to look at it. Uh, what do you see? Uh, what do you hear from that sector about this new, in, about this invention? I'll call it invention because it looks strange to all of us. But I think Dr. Iri has been able to let us know today that it's not FRS that put it there. It's uh, the National Assembly, but I think we are going to send some message to the National Assembly from our audience about this today. So, let me see, being somebody that has been in this terrain, advising secondary school on school owners, helping them in their strategy, putting things together. So, what, what do you hear from them as regards this change that has come just opening the year? We saw this change. Um. Thank you so much, James. It's my absolute uh, pleasure to be um, on this platform today. Um, good morning as well to my seniors and colleagues who um, honored my invitation uh, to join as well. Um, now to the subject at hand. I'm going to borrow from our native parlance. I think that's probably the only thing that can do the reaction justice. Uh, James, myself, and my seniors and colleagues in the educational sector, we are not smiling at all. Wow. 
Um, my initial uh, poll when I reached out to my school clients and other school associations, there was just an outcry. Uh, permit me to paint a picture here. Uh, private school owners are currently feeling a huge vacuum. A vacuum created by the gross inadequacy of the Nigerian government to provide good quality education for every Nigerian child. The government is unable to meet the demand for volume or for quality. Now, private school owners are ID should ideally be seen as partners to the government, augmenting the provision of primary basic social services to the Nigerian child. However, this is not the case. Uh, introductions like this of the new uh, tax laws that are adding an additional burden really means that the government does not see us as partners, does not see us as people filling the vacuum that they have created. So there's such a huge tax burden, multiple levies and statutory remittances that make the cost of doing business quite punitive. So like I said, we are not smiling. Yeah, you see, I, I, I hear you. And if I need to just test the mind of everybody around, that is what the mindset will be. But one thing come handy, if it thing has become a tax law, so it's just a way of looking at a soft landing that I will now be looking for. So, so let me come to you, Dr. Iri. So you, you add uh, the feedback uh, from YMC, who is a representative of the, the educational sector. So that th this thing, they are not smiling. So is FRS looking at some, or government actually, looking at some other area of quality that they want to give, knowing fully well that these people are supporting in this, uh, delivering these public goods to, to the training masses in Nigeria. Dr. Eric. Sorry, you need to unmute your mic, sir. Dr. Eri, you need to unmute your mic. Off. I think we 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 lost him. Oh, hoping that he's going to be back here. So so let me come to you, Audrey. So if you look at what you touched on during the presentation as in the, the incorporation form of this educational institution. But Dr. Ria has come during his own uh, discussion that that will not hold water. And I believe is that this form is still contained in our coming and like matter. So what was your view about that, Audrey? Um, thank you very much, James. Um, even though the FRS is taking the position that you know, uh, educational institution, depending on what form they should be set up as, will be taxable. It's also important to also look at that section 23, subsection 1, which still avail other opportunity, right, for educational institutions to still be exempt. For instance, if it is, remember, it is if it is in a public character, set up as a public character, and then also is set up as a charity. They are avenue for, for you know, uh, companies limited by guarantee to then be exempt. Um, recall that they do not have a profit and it says profit. It says the profit, if the profit is from other activity, business activity, because it is possible for a company limited by guarantee to be engaged in other activity other than the activity of providing or promoting educational activity. So for those other service, for those other, yes, so there is still a chance whereby if it is then set up as a charitable organization, then it is possible for it to still be exempt from taxes. But then it is now left for them to make that argument. So they need to, and it's also important that the association as itself make a business case to the government to see how they promote. And like Yemisi did say, that they are there to support, you know, social service for the government since this is lacking within the country. 
Uh, yeah, so thank you, Audrey. So, so Sama, do, do, um, do, do you have anything you want to add to what Audrey have just said now? Because I, I'm looking at if this um, provision in the Company Allied Matter Act is still there, that a company is limited by guarantee and they are able to plow back whatever profit they have back into the business, that the issue of, I mean, subjecting it to tax we know, although Dr. Hilly will still need to come and provide some, some clarity on that. Okay, thank you very much, James, and uh, good morning to our teaming listeners. Uh, the, the thing about it is not so much of profits. Uh, you may perform a business or perform certain activities without making a business, without making some uh, business profits. But the key thing that I'll be looking at from this area is a reconsideration by government on this particular subject matter. Um, while I agree with YMC to the effect that, yes, these organizations have uh, over the years uh, assisted uh, government in providing this particular service, closing our eyes to a particular section of the law that touches on whether you made profit or not, you must pay tax. So which is the minimum tax angle, okay? It's, 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 it's going to be tied directly to 0.5%, which is currently at about 0.25% of the turnover that is declared by these organizations. So while I may be doing my business and I'm saying it is not for profit, or in a particular year, I did not make a gain, um, there is still that provision that says I must pay something minimum. But be that as it, be that as it may, um, it is key to note that um, operations, um, corporations outside this country and also go through something similar in one way or the other. The thing about it, if you look at what happens in Kenya, significantly private schools, they pay um, corporate income tax or company income tax as they call it there. But there are certain incentives that comes directly to these organizations. India, in its own case, okay, does not pay at all. They only subject some uh, tuition houses to taxes, but in terms of the core private and um, this, the ones that we're talking about here, in India, nothing is paid from them. When you go to South Africa, uh, that particular country exempts certain research organizations. Now, if indeed we want to prioritize education, personally, I think this is not the time for us to be subjecting educational institutions into um, this kind of tax. But um, the way it is, there is still a leeway here, subject to the next uh, uh, Finance Act, because if you go to uh, paragraph three of the Personal Income Tax Act, entities that are registered as sole traders or partnerships that are involved in carrying out educational activities are not to pay any tax. In, in, because that particular section of the law has not been amended. But I may go to say that most of the schools, you have around a significant number of them at about 70% or so are limited by shares or, um, or by guarantee in one form. So uh, most of these schools are actually caught in the web of these tax matters. Yeah, so, 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 so thank you, Sama, for that, for bringing even uh, what happened in other clients um into this uh discussion this morning so i don't know if we we have dr iri available now because i know our team audience will really want to hear the his view about the the question i lay earlier dr iri so so james um in chem is there is there anything you can do from your end to Hello? unmute dr Are you Iri? Unmute yes. me? okay, okay. That's done. Yeah, that, that is done. So, so Dr. Irene, so, so, yeah, we can hear you. You're welcome back. Okay, great. Now, uh, uh, thank you once again. I quite uh, share in uh, the sentiments that have been thrown up, especially by our principal consultant, EMC, yeah. and others. Uh, you see, the, the art, as it, as it were, that uh, CITA Session 23, Subsection 1C 
they were the, they were the charitable or educational activity was used like an alternate uh, word one this or that so it may it's it, it even equated the educational activity to charitable function so that was what it is and also uh, another word was added as long as those activity are of a public character now let's cast our mind back to public character what is public character that is something that is set up basically for the purpose of the common good of uh, everyone in the country. And uh, in doing that, this uh, let's look at some mind back to something like NGO that are set off to support one cause or the other. You see, these NGO do not charge fees. They don't. Instead, they rely on donations and free will gifts that people give to them. But these uh, institutions, these private institutions that have just been tampered with in the Finance Act 2021, are they relying on donations to run the to run the institutions? The answer is no. They charge fees, and in fact, very exorbitant for that matter. I don't know if any of you have children in private schools, whether the fee they pay is the same thing as the public schools, where they pay a patent fee like 30,000 per, per annum for public school, but uh, the private school charge as much as two, three million fees. And to me, this is like business. Like, this is a personal opinion anyway, but uh, you know, you'll be taking that FRA position. But what we are saying here is that um, if we cast our mind back to what this uh, private institution actually do, they are, they are veered from their, most of them are veered from their objects and they actually, uh, they've gone into trade or business, so to say trade or business in the form of fees that they charge for this activity. The nature of a, a charitable organization is that you depend on charity from the public and in form of donation, in form of zakat, in form of a gift, you know, to support the cause and truly it's actually free. And they, you see they like invested, they don't share any profit to any professor or any, but we expect if this private institution are also going to training uh, lecturers for example but they push from this public institution too they push from them and because they are unable to even pay in spite of the high fee that they charge they are unable to actually develop uh, the 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 teaching uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, staff so to say but let's leave that but the point here is that there there's element of trade and business that have been introduced into all this activity. Even those who say, do claim that they are registered by guarantee, are they truly applying back all what they make into the institution? Well, if it is, fine, no problem. But the point here is that the law, we are here to implement whatever the National Assembly put out there as the law. And we as implementer, we are obedient servant to what they tell us to do. We just obey and we carry it out. It may not be too palatable, but that is the law as it is today. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, so, so Dr. Eric, thank you for that submission. But, but yes, let me just let me just add this before before you move. I will move the mic to one of the other panelists. But if you look at it, so it shows that the government are not looking at the side of the 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 educational institution, the private owned one. The way they are trying to argument the the the, the breakdown. And the, the 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 thing that has gone down in the educational sector in Nigeria, because you will agree with me. The effort they've put in so far has really helped us to get good graduates into our companies. Has helped us to get good people that can measure up to 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 I mean attract some job outside the country. So is it that the government is not looking at that area that they are trying to sort of like fill the gap for the gap that has been created over time? Uh, do not forget that uh, apart from the company contract that has just been introduced, all the other all the other incentives still remain as they are. In fact, in 2029, they introduced an uh, uh, exemption to the, the fees that tertiary institution uh, uh, student pay, either nursery, primary, or tertiary institution, all the fees that they pay, they exempt them from that. It wasn't so before. This is another incentive to help the private uh, sector. And to pay 7.5% of the fee, you can imagine what it means. 
because it's just a service they render, it's not a production. So, and this uh, is, is, is a, it, to me, it's an incentive to also help them, to help them, you understand? Even capital gain tax, as long as it's not trade or business, it's also the exemption still remain as it is. In a value added to iron pay. So they are all there. They are, uh, the only thing they introduce is the profit they make from this business. And this business, because they are charging fee that has taken them from charitable uh, nature to that of business or trade. That is what the only thing that the National Assembly have just done here. And let's see how it runs. And uh, to me, the other incentives still remain. And uh, government have done some something good that we need to also applaud them in this uh, regard. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Henry. But I, I will submit that I, I will, on behalf of the educational sector, request for more incentives, more uh, cushion effect, so that this will not be trans, I mean, transisted to those parents that are paying uh, uh, these uh, school fees. So, so, so let me, let, let me, I mean, rotate the mic back to you. Now, looking at the the sector now you've made us to see that the operators in this sector educational sector are not smiling at all now let's just look at uh look at it you you've been involved in asking helping them with some strategic moves strategic direction in the past so this is coming as an add-on that they will need to have some strategy in place to be able to be tax mm -hmm. compliance and also know be overboarding or overtaxed by Federal Inland Revenue Service. So, so well, what do you see yeah, as in, how, how do you think that this will add more to what they are doing? How are they going to welcome it? What, what is out there for the owners of schools? Thank you so much, James. Um, I think it's fair to say that this is quite a new development. Um, so I, I wouldn't really expect um, a lot of school leaders to already be on track to um, having a game plan in place. Uh, the keen interest showed by school leaders in this webinar leads me to believe that um, customer, customer engagement from tax authorities needs to be better. So there was a real lack of awareness of this new development, a lack of awareness by a lot of schools as to what this would mean um, for their organizations. Um, a huge majority of schools were not aware of the changes and intricacies, uh, which is why such a session today is really, really very welcome. Um, my initial polling of my clients is a real feeling of concern because typically when you're faced with um, situations such as this where there will be an additional operational expense, um, it's usually one of two things. It's either you moderate your quality so there's a dip in the quality um, so that you can still charge the same or your the, 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 the charges to the end user, to the consumer goes up, which means fees go up. It's usually one of the two. Um, so, I mean, let me take your mind back to a practical example. You know this Okin biscuit or Oxford biscuit? You know, when we were growing up, there were probably like five or six in the pack. And as we grew older, the number in the pack continued to reduce. Now, so the, the company was trying to sort of maintain the pricing so that they didn't price themselves out of the market. But what happened? The quality of the product diminished. So really, what um, someone like myself will be working on with school leaders and what school leaders I would encourage them to begin to do is to begin to sort of strategize to determine how this will affect uh, their school businesses, how they're able to maintain that balance between still preserving the quality of their offering and yet not uh, passing on as much of the cost to the parents so that they don't end up pricing themselves out of the market because these things do happen. Once you raise your fees, what it is is that you then have customers who are moving on or, or um, who are sort of moving down to the next tier of school. So you sort of start to see a shift. Uh, parents who then can no longer afford a certain um, uh, grade of fees begin to move to a school that's lower and then you begin to see sort of like a shift happening. So it would be a case of really trying to create that balance. Um, and this is where strong leadership direction is really, really important so that the service offering of schools don't get watered, watered down. But to be fair, um, incentives are really, really needed so that the quality of, and the standard does not get diminished. Because what it's looking like now, it's looking like 
I know uh, Dr. Ibri referred to uh, exemption from VAT. So what it's looking like is that you get a concession today and then tomorrow you're, there's another additional statutory remittance. So it, it doesn't really make sense. What it is is that they're supposed to be progressively and ease so that private school um, providers can continue to provide the level and the, the quality of service that they are currently doing. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, you see, thank you for that. And uh, that is one of the things as uh, also a stakeholder in this uh, educational sector. As a parent, I will not want the private institution to do. They don't need to water down uh, the quality because it's because of the quality that some of us are praying, paying through our notes. And uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Iri has noted, that is even why they want to be taxed. So, so Audrey, let, let me come to you with this. So knowing fully well now that it has been established, the fee that the schools are charging is what brought them into this uh, discussion that we're having this morning. So and you, you, from your experience, I know, dealing with uh, tax authority during a return filing and also doing tax audit or investigation, the bedrock of drumming home, whatever your claim are, is you having a very good documentation. So how do you think the, the private school owners need to go about this? Because not having that in place can mean that you may even be paying above what you should be paying. And I know Dr. Eri say it's sad to collect. So Audrey, what do you think the private school owner need to look at to ensure that they have a very robust and good um, documentation so that whatever claim they want to have in their tax return, they can sort of like defend that in case of tax audit or tax investigation. Um, thank you very much, James. Um, that is really key. It is very, very paramount because as much as possible as a school, as a business owner generally, you want to minimize costs as much as possible. And tax is one major cost that can be very significant, right? And so the only thing that can actually help you um, scale through this process in trying to minimize your tax cost will then be your documentation. It is a very key part of every business because it tells, you know, if it's in terms of contract, it tells whether that contract has been priced correctly. Um, it tells the terms of those contracts that um, prices has not been adjusted in a, in a, in a funny way. It, it, it spells out everything in detail. And even in terms of your invoice, it tells, um, you know, um, the the the, the um, terms uh, and the property of that even document, right? To see that you don't have multiple transactions. And then in terms of payroll, it, as it concerns your staff, it also tells the terms in terms of their their costs. And because that is some area that um, you know the government from our tax audit generally the revenue will be interested in. They would want to look at your costs to make sure that you've correctly stated it. You know, we're very, very familiar with what we call the rent test. Is it holy? Is it necessary? Is it exclusive? Do you understand? Is it reasonable in terms of those costs? And these documentations are things, you know, they are the underlining documentation to do your accounting, for instance. And then the other part will then look at your revenue. What is it that you have charged in terms of whether it's a tuition fee or even, you know, a service that you've rendered? So the government will want to see all of that. All of these things is also to make sure that they assess you to the right taxes. So it's very key that you know school um, school institution now train their staff to make sure that all this is in place. That even for the transactionary taxes, as it concerns their contractors and suppliers or vendors, that well they have deducted those right and they've done the right filing and I, I want to even extend that even to what will then be enjoyed even as capital allowance that will further reduce their tax liability they want to make sure that for those assets all the documents supporting those are really in place in order to give them that advantage to actually minimize their tax cost thank you yeah so, so audrey thank you i i, I think uh we've recorded success here so so we have a uh, uh, professor akito here uh on now prof you, you you are welcome to to the panel section yeah we understand you are in nigeria 
You understand what in Nigeria? So don't worry. Thank you very much. Yeah, our prayer is that things will get better over time. So, 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 Prof, let me just pick you up straight away as you just came into the room. So it is obvious now that the tax environment in the educational sector has changed. So uh, the question or what I am trying to you now is that uh, is this going to be a sustainable practice? Looking at your involvement with private um, uh, uh, universities. So then how, how do you think the, the owners of private university or the board of trustees, how will they drive this? So that this will not become a big issue for them. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for, for the day. Incidentally, I was able to listen to all the uh, discourse so far, and I am very happy that Dr. Dick uh, Iri is here uh, from the FRS uh, because I wanted to pick some information from here uh, from the public. That's very important because. We are Nigerians together, uh, talking seriously. I, I was introduced as being um, a visiting professor to none. That that's not correct. Also, I'm actually of the University of Badon, a faculty of economics and uh, social sciences of the University of Badon. That's in addition to Babcock. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, the coordinator. Uh, I'm talking very seriously. I'm going to raise some very serious issues there, which I want all of us to pick. Uh, one of the presenters, uh, who is uh, a business owner, raised an issue for me. The question that we ask here is now okay, oh. So, is it sustainable? So, uh, let me say. Uh, we've been talking of the use of uh, very clearly that Nigeria scored very, very low in this of doing business. Uh, I'm aware that if you look at literature from red to now, if you're talking of this of doing business, that is the most friendly society. So, if you are a, a, a business friendly environment with your regulations, you score one. Nigeria scored 131. In 2019, from literature. In 2021, Nigeria went to 133. And it was estimated that by the end of 2022, Nigeria will move to 135. Now, this being equal, let me say this very clearly. Uh, am I very old? Hello? Yeah, we Hello? can hear you, Prof. We can okay. hear you, sir. Please. Now, let me say this, and uh, uh, with all sense of a uh, military awareness, education ordinarily ought to be the business of governments, of a public character. That's the truth. All over the world, education is first of all the business of governments. Most of the people that are in, in governance today, everywhere, wouldn't have had that opportunity if there were no free education in those days. So it is important that we all understand what we are discussing. I'm not, I, I'm not advised to, we know very clearly because our revenue from oil uh, is deadly. And therefore we need uh, taxes to be able to make up our uh, facilities and provisions. But we should be very careful about uh, what we put on as our policies so that it's not counterproductive in the end. Now, private all universities or educational institutions, they currently incur huge expenses, rents, transports, building costs, licensing, lighting, power, so on and so forth, including the ICT facilities. Now, let me put on, on this. To run a, a primary school, to start a primary school now, you need a minimum of about 10 million naira as of today. I'm telling you, I'm a living witness because my wife was to start a, a not a primary I gave her six million. I have not, I've not seen ten cover out of what they, they, they set up, uh, you know, the, the venture capital. To set up a secondary school, you need about a million of thirty million naira. And of course, if you are going to set up a university, they are told that about that. 
you need about an average of 500 million because the facilities you need to put in place, your license, everything. Those that are doing it now, I'm involved in one now. It has taken us about five years to put on this institution. So what I'm saying is this. All these costs, whatever we like it or not, are really transferred to consumers, to the parents, to the sponsor in the end. Unfortunately, look at now of institutions we have now. So many of these environments will not have students, computers everywhere, and yet no government funding. I said I'm, I'm very happy that Dr. D is here. It's because you know the, the policy of public funding, as well as debt fund. Debt fund does extend the funding. To private institutions, I'm sure you are aware of that. But I'm, I work in the private and also in the public. The benefit some of us are, we're having is because we have dual citizenship or to say residency rule. Now, if you cannot pass in a private environment, so if you are in a private environment, you are made to, to put all your bills together. And let, don't let us, let me say, without any iota uh, of sentiment, uh, business of education is not easy to come here, mm. and I, I'm happy. I am not quarreling with the word, we, we, we're removing the word profit. What is profit? Excess. Now, you just got to be of a business. I, I, I'm sure anybody will know that when you put in all your costs of running a business, you may have nothing left in the end. So, what we're saying is this now, the consequences of this is very clear because before we now say, this is sustainable. I have to lay that fund. Now, the consequence is number one, flow of shops. Some of those educational environment will close shops. No doubt about that. If the bills are huge and issues are coming up, number two, they have imagined. If it's possible, it's visible. You don't enjoy our environment. It's not an environment where margin uh, uh, you know, is easy. Then huge cost, not affordable, will we have no, by willing parents. So some of these children you are talking about with future destinies, they will be disadvantaged. They won't be able to get anywhere. Even what they are charging today now, people are complaining. So some of them will drop out of faith and go to wherever. If we have alternative institutions, profit institutions that are competitive, nobody wants to go. If I have, if I can go to Yadu Abado and pay ten thousand school fees, why should I go to Babcock? Why should I go to Covenant? But we are saying that these facilities are not there. As of today, now, we, we can listen to what Ashwin is saying in front of the university. So the, 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 the effect is that juvenile delinquency, this Yahoo, Yahoo boys, stealing, robberies, all those things will continue. What is sustainability? By my definition, I can tell you 2019. Sustainability is to me managing today effectively without sacrificing or jeopardizing tomorrow that is promising and keeping a good hope for the very long tomorrow for those that are coming behind. So without missing words, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my, 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 my take home is this, except with in, in, in decisive policies to intervene, to assist the educational sector, the private sector, and to impartialize the public education uh, system, now, bringing any additional body, no matter the way we call it, yes, to us, revenue is, is necessary. But without palliatives of subsidy, scholarship, interventions, and it is done to public as of today, public institutions are granted third fund. Go to all different universities. You see third fund building, third fund hostel, third fund all this and that. These are not available in the private environment until that is done. Now, I'm not about to tax it. If you're going to tax, let there be palliative of also making some of this fund because private and public now pay the tax. Let the third fund, the funding from government, extend to private institutions right from the primary to tertiary institution. So that, that, will, that will relieve some, some uh, them of some bodies. Otherwise, it's going to create a shift and sustainability will, will, will be just a, 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 a map. Rather than reality. That's my take home. So, it's will, yeah, not so, so be, will not be possible if we don't do this. We don't intervene. As we tax them, 
let's also extend the third fund, the funding from government to private institution from primary to tertiary. Thank you very much. So, so, so thank you, Professor Akintoe. And I think you, you've really, I mean, hit the head of the nail rightly by saying that more incentive, more incentive need to come for people operating in this um, uh, in this sector, because if not, the body will be too much and that extending it that they too need to eat from the cake of that fund. They need to be able to eat from there. So, so without much ado, I think it is good now and it's a very good ground for us to move to, to question and answer. So we have a lot of questions that we've, uh, I mean, gotten in the chat box so we'll take some of them but please if there are questions here that we could not attend to here the email address this to the audience the email addresses that you've provided we are going to send those questions together with the answers to them after the the webinar so let me quickly move to some of the questions here and i, I think the first one I, I will i will throw the first one to 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 hear me see so, yeah, me see, I, I've asked you the question about the issue of uh, uh, throat, do you, the, the issue of uh, shifting the body. So, but I, I have a question here that you being a renowned educational consultant, how will the obligation to pay income tax impact the strategic direction of educational institution in Nigeria? So it's one of the questions that we are in the chat box here. That I, how will this uh, payment of tax, the obligation that has come on them, like Dr. Iri has mentioned, that they have obligation, which has been, I mean, dealt with very well this morning. So, the impact, what strategic direction do you think uh, the uh, private school now should be looking into now? Um, well, I think I touched um, on a little bit bit of it earlier on uh, when I mentioned that uh, there will be a need to sort of um, maintain a delicate balance between uh, trying not to uh, moderate or dampen the quality of the service offering um, and then also try not to pass on um, a lot of the cost onto the parents so that schools are not pricing themselves out of their Is, uh, within our sector is we have a it, well it's not a challenge really it's, I think it's the best thing possible we have a lot of passionate um, men and women who are um, really committed to um, learning delivery really committed to child development so there's the passion but there's not always the business sense there's not always that commercial awareness now in light of so when a business in light of this mandatory additional operational costs that really uh, we don't appear to have a choice about, then we, we might be looking at in the school sector, school businesses to begin to diversify. Um, school businesses have existing fixed assets which could really uh, be used for vertical or horizontal integration. So for instance, I mean, I, I know a number of schools are currently, currently have a training school. Um, some schools currently have after school clubs which uh, are open to external. Some schools are currently uh, leasing um, so their premises for alternative use. So it might be that some schools need to begin to think about things like this so that we're not going the way of Okin Biscuit where we're reducing and we're watering down the quality or we're not going the other way where we are indirectly um, driving our clients to go um, to go to other schools. So I, it's things like this. It, it just means Strong leadership direction is needed at this time. Let's go back to the drawing table. Let's look at what effect this has on the way we run business and let's begin to think of really, really um, innovative ways to be able to accommodate it. Um, I'm not saying we should accept it wholeheartedly and I hope I'll have the opportunity to, to touch on that later, but in the interim, as a start, let's begin to think about those things. Yeah, so, so thank you, Yeps. You, you sort of like hit on what the policy direction should be for the schools owner. So Audrey, I have a question here which I, I, I would like you to attend to. The question says yeah, that you mentioned capital allowance completion. How will the educational institution compute 
they are capitalized for qualifying assets already in use before Finance Act 2021 amendment. So uh, how, how do you think that will work? Okay, so um, thank fully, you. Sorry, sorry, no fully well, during the time that they've been using the assets in the prior year, they were under exemption. So what happened to their capital allowances? How do we go about it? Okay. Um, thank you so much, James. Um, I, I'm actually going to address two aspects um, to your question. One will deal with since these entities were exempt in the first place, and now that that exemption has been lifted, then what then happens to um, the, the capital allowance for those assets that are still existing? Right. Um, recall that part of the discussion we had earlier is the fact that what is not documented is not done. So it's important that all documentation regarding that asset is in order, right? Because now you would need to do a review of those information to determine when was that asset put into use? What is the you know the 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 lifespan of that asset? What's the the capital the the capital allowance um, the number of years granted for capital allowance from a tax perspective on that particular asset? You would need to make that determination to understand the tax written down value of that asset for tax purposes in order to then claim the remainder of um, that asset uh, because if that asset has been fully utilized and um, the reason based on the, the the provision of the law it's no longer allowable for you know tax deduction for purpose of capital allowance then you cannot use that asset anymore however for the assets because it has been in use that asset also uh, the capital allowance as as at the period where that asset was put into use cannot be claimable and, and that is based on the Finance Act um, 2021 um, amending and uh, section 31 where it says that capital allowance will now be restricted um, to the extent um, of the company generating an accessible profit. So at that period that assets the capital allowance at the time um, the educational institutions were not paying taxes they, they cannot use their but then going forward is to determine the tax written down value and see if the remaining life is still in existence in line with the provision of the law and then they can claim the capital allowance going forward for those remaining years. Yeah, so so, so th thank you Audrey for that clarification. I think uh, by the time the schools owner begin to get more information and clarity when FRS comes up with the explanatory note for the Finance Act 2021, will be able to get more information as you that. So um, let me pick you with these two questions. Very, very germane question. Uh, Edward asked a question here saying, what is the effective date of the implementation of the new act 2020? And will there be retrospective application for the prior year before the new amendment? So, so Samak, can, can you quickly take that? And in addition, okay. please just add to it, sorry. Just add this to it. Uh, Alan is asking a question here. Can the school claim refund for CIT taxes paid to FRS over the past years? So I think Alan uh, is a school owner or a stakeholder who has been involved in paying coming income tax before. So it's like, can they have a, 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 a refund on that? So okay, um, thank you very much. Um, so I will say that uh, the effective date of the said act is 1st of January 2022. So everything we've been talking about, particularly with reference to putting your books in order and on and on, will have to be effective uh, 1st of January 2022. Nobody is going to audit you for companies income tax for 2021. But if you are the type that has not been preparing your finances, um, you may need to check those figures that you are bringing forward from 2021 into 2022 from an accounting perspective. Now, um, is, can, can, can you get a refund? The answer is yes on paper. You can get a refund from the Federal Inland Revenue Service for excess or taxes that you are paid that probably you are not supposed to pay one 
or for things that you have probably overpaid. But it's kind of getting strange and somehow to now for a, a group of people that we said have not seen that to been liable to corporate income tax uh, to start with um, a refund. But if that is the case, if you have been paying taxes, remember what we are talking about here is taxation of that educational activities. Now, you may be a school that has been involved in uh, leasing out your properties here and there. You lease out um, your properties for weekend parties and so many things. Those items, either two, were subject to tax and we continue, will be, uh, will continue to be subjected to tax. But the one we're talking about now actually relates to those fees. Okay? It relates to those fees. So I will say effective date, 1st of January 2022, and the second one will be that, yes, you can get a refund, but for the refund, um, the FIRS will normally subject you to an audit. And when you are being audited by the special FIRS team, it will mean that um, while you may have a refund from corporate income tax, FRS wants to be sure that you are not indebted to them in any way on other forms of taxes, such that um, you have to, I'm saying you just have to be careful before, uh, I can see Dr. Smiley, uh, you have to be very careful before you approach. Uh, make sure you do your very good review just to confirm that FIRS indeed, uh, uh, that they are indeed indebted to you. Thank you. James, yeah, so I, the, the second question, what was the second question, James? I, I thought I missed uh, one. No, you've touched on, on that. you touched on that. The first okay, one was okay. talking to the period of implementation, and the second one is as regards the reform, which you just uh, uh, give, okay. some, give okay. some thoughts on now. So, so, so quickly, because we just have five minutes more for this question and answer, we need to move to to the concluding part of the the webinar. So, but I, I still have a very, a very good, interesting question I'm rolling in here. So, um, please, clarity on the zero to thirty percent CIT threshold. So, um, Audrey, can you quickly take that? Then I move to Professor Akintoye uh, with this question: That can we, Professor Akintoye, can we insist that government should assist uh, private school owners with enabling environment? before they start taxing them. So that paying the tax will not be out of body, but it's going to be out of um, a, a very good position. So I'm coming to you on that. So Audrey, can you quickly give that clarity on the, the threshold that is okay. involved in this item? Thank you very much, James. Um, regarding the threshold, I mean, that's an introduction from the Finance Act of 2019, um, where the government has now given a threshold prior to 2019, um, the standard CIT rate was at 30%, but with the introduction of the Finance Act in 2019, that actually gave a threshold to uh, dividing companies into small, medium and large. Now, so for a small entity where you have a, um, your, your threshold of turnover is 25 million, you pay a CIT of 0%. Right, and that in, as an introduction of 2020, that extended it even to um, the tertiary education um, levy, whereby um, if you're still a small entity, you expected not to pay that as well. So, zero percent in CIT, zero percent in education tax. But for an entity that is above 25 million and to the extent of 100 million, then you will be paying CIT at a rate of. Um, 20 percent and then a large entity which will be 100 million and above in terms of um, turnover threshold will then pay um, a C um, CIT at the rate of 30 percent. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you Audrey. So, so Professor Akintori, I don't know if you caught uh, what uh, I just mentioned the other time as uh, one of the questions here to you that ca ca can yes, we I mean ask government before you implement this provide enabling environment for the private school owners because they are helping you in what's supposed to be your duty. Go ahead. Sir. Thank you very much. Hello, are you hearing me? Yeah, we can hear you, Prof. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let me, my, my chorus answer will just be very clear. Simple answer, yes, because in the social contract model, uh, that's why uh, on the one hand, we are not about to governments talking to educational institutions and asking them to pay something. But on the other hand, government too, to be able to be able to collect what we're talking about, even taxing them on anything. There's need for, you mentioned security, all those things, you are, we are aware of what happened to some uh, children at the federal government college and all those places. You know that private uh, institutions may not be able to cope with those security challenges except by government. So we are saying that as it's done all over the world, government should pick up basic responsibility of providing amenities, security, facilities to this private environment uh, so to be able to operate uh, you know seamlessly so that they can also generate i mean be able to help these children but basically what i don't want us to forget as a take home is that i have said it when i started and i'm happy with our parents and even whether we work for IRS or anywhere we are all parents we are all involved which you know that these institutions private or public they are to engage our children to create future for them so even when we are taxing them, we are going to them. I am appealing also to the IFRS that when you send people there, let them be well trained to know that they go to an environment where futures are created, where destiny will be molded. So to that extent, you don't tax to kill, you tax to sustain. So to that extent, federal government should create, you know, facilities, provide facilities, basic facilities to enable this environment to run seamlessly, so that they can also bring these children. Basically, before you make profit in a normal business environment as accountants, you must break even. Let's create an environment for them to break even, create a, a platform for these children to succeed before we start talking of taxing them. That's very important. Thank you very much. So, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Akintoye. And uh, uh, let me use this opportunity to thank all the panelists. You've really dropped very good points on the ground here which will continue to to uh, to to re-evolve in the mind of private school now federal inland revenue service the government and we also the consultant so uh, at this point we'll be drawing the curtain on the q a and uh, i i want uh to meet up with Samak Bey on behalf of our uh, tax leader to give uh, the closing remark and the next step and how ey um can be of help to the private school owner in relation to this new uh, thing that has come on them. So over to you, Temi Tokwan. Thank you very much, James. Um, and uh, let me, in addition to the special thanks that James had given to thank and recognize uh, Professor Ishola Kintoye uh, for giving us this time we know you are a very busy man, and uh, we also would like to appreciate uh, Dr. Dick Eri, who I also call a prof, and uh, as, as, as well as Yemisi. Uh, Yemisi has been in this business for quite a while, and we appreciate your drive and uh, concerns as to how this particular inclusion in the Nigerian tax and regulatory environment will affect the educational institution. Uh, thanks to Audrey Obedike for helping out uh, with this particular presentation, as well as to James. But special thanks will go to the teaming uh, attendees as well, uh, who have given special time to this. I remember this morning I got a note from uh, Professor Akintoye to the fact that the Mitokwe, I know we have not done this, but I want a rematch, please. I need VCs and um, top business owners to be in the room. But some of these people are unfortunately not available because of the processes ongoing in the Nigerian university system. So the thing about it at the end of the day is that uh, whether it's business or not, uh, this particular sector is helping government to form uh, the future. Um, most of us, including me, did enjoy i didn't go to a private uh, a private school i went to um a public school 
right from the beginning, but we all can tell how those schools look like today. So um, trying to yeah. collect tax from some of these schools today now may actually be counterproductive without having some things in place. Uh, we cannot tell all of them to go and register as partnership or as um, uh, uh, sole proprietors uh, because come next year, we don't even know what will be coming out of the Finance Act because that paragraph three of the Personal Income Tax Act may actually be changed again. OK, so the thing about it is for school operators, there are opportunities even within the current situation, and that is where EY comes in. We are able to work with you to navigate as much as possible. You see, uh, when I look at the current taxes, I will always say this is the era of penalty and interest. While you are paying your correct taxes, when the time comes, you want to avoid being imposed with huge penalty and interest charges. So this presentation will be shared with all of you, which follow 